Good afternoon and welcome to the aptly named Maureen Stapleton Theater for this celebration of the remarkable life and career of proud Trojan, loyal crusader, devoted mother, and extraordinary actress Maureen Stapleton. Please feel free throughout the program to take photos, but please now do mute your cell phones. And now, please welcome your host, Emmy-winning film critic, entertainment reporter, and member of the Catholic Central class of 2016, Jackson Murphy. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody, welcome. Glad to be here. This is going to be quite a day. Lonely Hearts, Playhouse 90, Car 54, Where Are You? Queen of the Stardust Ballroom, Heartburn, Bye Bye Birdie, The Electric Grandmother, Toys in the Attic, Plaza Suite, Reds, Cocoon, Interiors, that's just a dozen. I could name dozens more. On the count of three, I want you all to shout out your favorite Maureen Stapleton film, TV show, stage play performance. You ready? One, two, three. Wow, that was great. And we're gonna talk about all of those and so many more here today. We're gonna honor this Troy native, this Catholic Central graduate, and this Hollywood icon. We have her Oscar, Emmy, and Tony here today. Isn't that unbelievable? <laughs> the day before the Academy Awards, the excitement is building. It's my favorite time of the year, and to be a part of an event like this just adds to it. Also, I do want to acknowledge our panelists who will be up here later, and her family is with us here today as well. So we're so thrilled that you're all here to share in this celebration. It's the centennial year for Catholic Central, Hudson Valley. We thank all of them for being a part of this. And I want to bring up Hudson Valley's assistant professor of theater arts, Roseanne Ranieri, to come on up and get things going for us. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I am thrilled to be a part of today. What a special honor. And on behalf of the college, uh, I also would love to share a special welcome to you and a little bit of an introduction to this glorious space, the Maureen Stapleton Theater. This wonderful venue which does indeed have the privilege and distinction of being named after the extraordinary woman and artist we honor today, has significantly contributed to a legacy of supporting students pursuing their love of acting and theater and aspiring to careers in the arts. We are very fortunate that the Maureen Stapleton is a dedicated classroom space most of the courses offered in the theater arts program are held right here on stage, including the theater arts practicum courses through which students develop and present theater productions. The theater also hosts meetings for a variety of student clubs like theater club, cosplay club, uh, upcoming filmmakers club, and the choir club. It's the site of special workshops and activities, including our annual Shakespeare and Company week-long residency held every February. It's a shared space for college meetings and activities, and also events hosted by our cultural affairs program, including talks by some of the world's foremost artists and activists, like Stephen Sondheim and Gloria Steinem. The Stapleton Theater has been a really important gathering space for learning, sharing, for the best types of play and engagement, and also, and so importantly, for creating connections like the one we are creating this week with Catholic Central and with Maureen's beautiful family members, Daniel, Catherine, and Max. Great to meeting, be meeting you today. Uh, we love this theater so much, and we do believe that it channels the spirit of Maureen, 
her passion for her work, her full engagement, her courage, her vulnerability, her intelligence, her forthrightness, her generosity, and her humor. And she continues to inspire all who inhabit and enjoy this space. It's such an honor to be with you today, helping to celebrate Catholic Central and our beloved Maureen Stapleton. I'd now like to introduce you, please, to Catholic Central's Student Council Vice President, the absolutely delightful Kiana Lang. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kiana Lang, and I am currently a senior attending Catholic Central School. I'm honored to be gathered with you all today to celebrating the cinematic legacy Maureen Stapleton, class of 1942. A fellow crusader, Maureen's story shows passion, perseverance, and talent. I am the daughter of Chris and Jeanette Lang, and I reside in Clifton Park, New York. I plan to continue my athletic and academic career at Framingham State University, where I will continue my athletics in NCAA Division III volleyball with a major in psychology and a minor in communications. As an incoming seventh grader at Catholic Central School, I was, a, I was new and nervous. I decided to try out for the volleyball team. Little did I know it had opened so many doors and created a future for me. Fast forward to now, Catholic Central has given me six amazing years of a volleyball experience. Besides volleyball, I had also been playing lacrosse for Catholic Central since eighth grade. Since CCHS is a smaller school, most of the students knew each other. This affected the sports teams in a unique way. The Catholic Central lacrosse and volleyball team had grit, passion, and camaraderie. This made me want to come back and play again the following years. I'm not only involved on the court and on the field, but I'm also involved in my school community. I have been, the, I have been in student council since seventh grade. This allowed me to make more friends and interact with the student body. In ninth grade, I joined social media club for the school. This club has taught me about marketing, networking, and networking with my community. I have always been an outgoing person. However, I strongly believe that being more in touch with my school through these clubs made me have a stronger voice as a woman. Attending Catholic Central School since seventh grade, I have countless memories. However, a core memory that will always stick with me would probably be the basketball home games. As a little middle schooler, I would look up to these older kids and be in awe of them. To this day, I believe nothing can beat a classic high school basketball game. The people, the cheering, the memories. Attending CCS, these three things do not just apply to the sports games. As a senior that has been at Catholic Central since seventh grade, I have, ch I have seen changes. Not only did I grow at the school as a person, but I had the honor to see Catholic Central School grow as well. Though I'm here to represent Catholic Central School today, I am also here to thank, to thank, here to thank personally this school for where I am now and what it had gave me. My fellow classmates had, had asked to thank had asked to say thank you for celebrating with us today. They're just ho doing homework and studying for tests, so, they made, so they've made this video right here to say thank you. I close my eyes and I can see a world that's waiting up for me That I call my own Through the dark, through the door Through where no one's been before But it feels like home They can say, they can say It all sounds crazy They can say, they can say, I've lost my mind. I don't care, I don't care if they call me crazy. We can live in a world that we design. Cause every night I invent the brightest colors fill my head. A million dreams are key.
from far away Special things I compile Each one there to make you smile On a rainy day They can say, they can say It all sounds crazy They can say, they can say We've lost our minds Now please allow me to introduce our co-principal, Mr. Harrigan. Hello to everybody at, hello. Thank you, Kiana, for those very heartfelt remarks. My name is Richard Harrigan. I have the privilege to serve as co-principal of Catholic Central School. On behalf of my co-principal, Lily Spera, and myself, it is an honor to welcome all of you here to celebrate Catholic Central Centennial by honoring the legendary crusader from Troy, Academy Award-winning actress Maureen Stapleton. Catholic Central has spent a century educating the children of the, Cath uh, of the Capital Region in the Catholic tradition. With over 20,000 alumni worldwide, the impact graduates have made across the globe is truly astounding. From the beaches of Normandy to the halls of NASA, Crusaders have brought their Christ-centered foundation and a love for others to the world around them, and that has made all of the difference. We have now entered Catholic Central's second century of Catholic education and service to others. Throughout Catholic Central's journey, the core values of our school's character have remained steadfast. Identified in our beautiful alma mater, courage, constancy in the right, honor, and sacrifice. All of these are still alive, well, and evident each day among the entire Crusader landscape. Many of our alumni are here today to share in this milestone and to celebrate Catholic Central's heritage. At this time, would all Catholic Central alumni please stand and be recognized with a round of applause. Thank you so much for your support and for being part of the journey. Today's students stand on your shoulders and the legacy that you created. This past fall, we held our Monsignor Burns dinner and as part of our centennial celebrations, school leadership agreed that the time had come to honor one of the most celebrated and notable alumna, Maureen Stapleton of the class of 1942. Established in 1986 by the Catholic Central School School Board, the award is named in honor of Monsignor Edward J. Burns, who served as the school's first principal from 1923 to 1938. Monsignor Burns is remembered as a priestly man, a true role model who expected excellence from his students, his faculty, and himself. The crystal obelisk, which is the award itself, engraved with the school seal, is presented in memory of Monsignor Burns' commitment to excellence. Its design symbolizes the united force that is Catholic Central School, and the school's powerful influence on generations of students. Ms. Stapleton's great works on the stage and screen have long been a part of America's rich tapestry. Her tenacity and spirit, part of which were forged during her years at Catholic Central, provided a springboard to follow her dreams and make her way to the Broadway theater and then beyond. 
This powerful and talented woman is a part of the same rich history that includes 100 years of graduating classes, right up through the current student body in Latham. It is with great honor that I award Maureen Stapleton from the Catholic Central High School class of 1942 with the esteemed Monsignor Burns Award. Kathy, Dan, and Max, would you please join me to accept this award on behalf of your mother and grandmother. I just want to say thank you very much to everyone that's here and everyone that put this together. Thank you very much. Very honored, very humbled. Thank you. We're also very excited about our upcoming campus expansion, uh, of which you saw uh, a photo in the uh, recent video, which will include a new gymnasium, classrooms, and so much more. We look forward to you joining us in this next chapter of the amazing story that is Catholic Central. Thank you very much. And now back to Jackson. Thank you very much, Richard, Roseanne, Kiana. Wasn't that video wonderful? That presentation was great. Fantastic. Thank you all so much. We have a lot of people here today to honor Maureen, but there's somebody else who couldn't be here but wanted to send a special message. To everybody at the Maureen Stapleton Theater, I am Dave Carger from Turner Classic Movies, and I'm so happy to be here to help you kick off this exciting tribute to the life and career of the fabulous Maureen Stapleton. Now, because I was 12 years old in 1985, my introduction to Maureen Stapleton was because of her hilarious comedic performance in Johnny Dangerously, which I discovered at home on HBO about two hours down the Taconic State Parkway in northern Westchester County, and I watched that movie more times than I care to admit. And it wasn't until later that I found out and learned what a commanding and impressive performer Maureen Stapleton was, winning an Oscar, an Emmy, a Tony, and even being nominated for a Grammy. In other words, this close to an EGOT. Anyway, I think it's wonderful that you're celebrating her life and her career today. I'm with you in spirit, and I hope you have a wonderful event. Thank you, Dave Carger. Dave's a good friend, he's a fellow Critics' Choice Association member, and he was in Atlanta in the studio, and he loved doing that, and he loved Maureen Stapleton so much. So we thank Dave and the folks at Turner Classic Movies for making that happen. This is a unique honor for me to be here today to do this. Maybe it was destiny. Maureen and I have a lot in common. We were both born and raised in and around Troy, New York. We both went to Catholic Central, and if you see in the yearbook that's out there, maybe some of you saw it already or you'll see it afterwards in the class of 1942, you will also find my grandmother, Joan Cooley. And I have memories of her and memories of her talking about Maureen, seeing her win the Academy Award. So it's thrilling for me to be here. Maureen and I also both have Emmys. Hers is here, but enough about me. It's not about me. It's about Maureen and the incredible legacy and impact that she has had for decades, generations, people who are gonna discover these movies and shows and plays and these videos, and we have so much to show you and so much to talk about with the panel discussion that is coming up in a little bit. But right now, we are going to show you a great documentary short on Maureen, put together by her son, Dan Allen Tuck, and then we're gonna do a panel discussion, we'll have an audience Q&A, some more surprises. Please enjoy this look at the career and the life of Maureen Stapleton. Let's all play What's My Line. Now it's celebrity time on What's My Line. Time to meet our mystery guest. Mystery challenger, would you enter, please? Our mystery guest has now arrived and is seated beside me. 
Are you a motion picture performer predominantly? No. <laughs> I think I know. No, it couldn't be. Go yes, ahead. it could. Uh, you're on the stage primarily, right? Yes. Are you at the present time playing in a show on Broadway that's a big hit? Yes. yes. Is it the enormously talented actress by the name of... I think it's a wonderful idea that you're doing this. That is an, uh, an homage to your mother, who was an unusual, talented, gifted woman, who enjoyed her work and labored hard at it. Softly, just once. Let me feel your lips. She was one of the most interesting and complicated human beings I think I've ever known. She was great in the movies, too, because whenever Maureen would tear up on the stage, uh, on the screen, you, your heart would go out to her. I guess when, before you started painting, it just, it didn't make sense. What did? Existence. No. My existence didn't make sense. And you've seen some terrible things. Awful things. Yeah, you've been a witness. And you know. Yes. I've been a witness, and I know. You made some beauty, Miss Talbot. Out of this dark river country. She had a voice like a cello, and she had a way of way of, of talking like nobody else I ever knew. She sounded like she didn't know the English language. When am I going to see you again? You want to, don't you? <laughs> I was soon to find out that she not only knew it and could say it and could do anything with it. Well, say something nice to me. Goodbye kiss, maybe? You're not a very appreciative fella. Love him and leave him, is that it? Well, Mrs. Doyle, I, I didn't call you. All right, what did you call me up for? Who are you kidding? Listen, you wanted a sad story, you heard a sad story. You also wanted some action, and so did I. You're right. You're damn right I'm right. Anybody who worked with Maureen felt lucky because she gave you your performance. All you had to do was listen to her and respond, and there it would all be there. Listen to me! Who could give you your name? Eddie, I love you. I'm talking to you. I love you. No, you want something else, Eddie, and you can never have her. I'm telling you the truth. Please tell her goodbye forever. Oh, my God. Maureen says hello, and I cry. So utterly natural. Nothing ever seems planned. She's the funniest woman, bawdiest woman. Come on. Forget your crummy papers. Take him to a dirty movie. Karen, stop it. Sam, do you know what's playing on 6th Avenue? Uh, Freddy the Fruit and Ursula the Slut. I swear on my mother's life. Cheers. Did you cheat? Of course I did. Good boy. We did a musical evening, and when she came, she she looked like a bag lady. No makeup, and her hair kind of chopped off. And I thought, she's going to walk out on the stage. She went out, and she began the poem. It was so beautiful. You just fell apart. You just felt everybody was crying. Maureen Stapleton Reds. Thank you. I'm thrilled, happy, delighted, sober. <laughs> I want to thank Troy, New York, and my children, my family, my friends, 
and everybody I ever met in my entire life. <laughs> so when was the first time you knew that you wanted to be an actor? Oh, I was about four, five. Um, it wasn't because it was art or anything. I went to the movies all the time. And I, I was nuts about Gene Harlow and Clark Gable and Barbara Stanwyck, etc. And I thought if, if you were an actress, you were automatically beautiful, rich, and all these handsome guys would be nuts about you. I thought, what could be a better life than that? Now, Maureen was a nut about movie stars and movies. She used to have all these magazines about what their life was like, and Joel McRae was her big love. She was in love with Clark Abel, with Joel McRae. I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> I'd say to her, does Clark know that you... <laughs> that you're also interested in Joel McRae? Well, we were first members of the actor's studio. It was like we had discovered a new religion. Maureen, at the time, had a, an apartment on 52nd Street, a salon, she called it, a salon. I thought she said saloon, but it was salon. And in the floor below her was Marlon Brando. And he used to come up, or we'd all go down, and it was, it was a wonderful, group of people interested in their work. would go, and I will never forget being at one of the salons. Marlon lived downstairs, and Jason Robards, and um, George C. Scott. We had great fun. The thing that always astounded me about her was how bright she was. But as I got to know her well, there was a lot of the child in her. I think she knew less than I did about <laughs> a lot of things. About sex, she thought she knew everything, right? She knew very little. I don't know anything about men and women. I never did, and mm -hmm. evidently I never will. You liar! You cruel, selfish, vicious! I, I, in, in the movies, it always stopped when they got married, the end. Right. So I never knew what to do after that. <laughs> 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 then, like, I thought, oh, that's it. <laughs> then God and Louis B. Mayer will take care of the rest of it. You know what I think? I think you want to get out. And you don't know how to tell me. It's not true. Which isn't? That you want to get out or that you don't know how to tell me? Why do you always start the most serious discussions in our life when I'm halfway out the door? No. Because if that's true, why don't you come right out and say it? Does he care and there's no point not going on? I mean, I'd rather hear it from you personally than get a message on our service. Look, we'll talk about it when I get back. No! God damn it, we'll talk about it now! I am not going to sit around a hotel room half the night waiting to find out how my life's going to turn out. If you have something to say, have the decency to say it. I just find it very exotic and wonderful that men and women live together and reproduce and do whatever they do. And, but how they make it, I don't know. Um, and then she had... A, a baby boy, which was you. And I remember going to, to see you for the first time. And uh, she said, don't expect much. <laughs> it isn't always, you know, easy. Or when my son was 14, I thought we had this great relationship. We talked and we laughed. And he went to school one day. He came home at 3 or whatever, and he hated me. <laughs> he hated my guts. And I just went to pieces. I, and I remember, <laughs> I remember calling Max, his father, and I'm crying, saying, I don't know what happened. Max kept saying, what happened? I said, nothing happened. He left this morning and he loved me. He came home and he hates my guts. <laughs> what happened? He hated my guts for about two years. <laughs> Being an actor and having children is very, very difficult. I think one of the most difficult professions. Because it's all about make-believe, being someone else, having to shed that after a performance. With Maureen, the shedding of character and the having to come into her real life was, was difficult, very, very difficult and to raise the children without a father at times, you know, without 
somebody being there all the time was, was difficult. But she did it. She did it and was great with you kids, I think. I mean, she may be too much, but she loved you kids. Kids, I've tried to raise you the best I could. Kids, all the things I've done were for your own good. Kids, can't you once appreciate how I've sacrificed working, slaving, scrimping, saving pennies and living with your father? Kids, no one knows the burdens I've had to bear and in my condition. Kids, I'm a poor sick woman and does he care? Ha! Go on, go on and kill me. That's what it's coming to when a mother has kids like you. She was capable of, of deep love, but also of such a low um, regard for herself. And that, that was true in acting too. I mean, she didn't, I don't think she really appreciated what she was capable of doing and what she, she did. I mean, she took on a lot. I miss her, I miss her terribly. Because when, when we were working, there was no one like her on the stage, no one. Frank, to learn to live like a woman and to leave something behind people who'll enjoy, that's all anybody could ask for. That was fantastic. Wow. Whew. I have seen that a few times now, and that last section gets me every time. Wow. We're going to talk to Dan about that. We're going to talk to all our panelists in just a minute. We're just bringing out a few chairs. Uh, and I love at the beginning with what's my line, right? The game shows. I'm a big game show fan, so that was a treat. You got to see her Oscar speech where she acknowledges Troy, New York. She will do that another time in something you'll see a little later on. We're going to do a panel here in a moment um, with some people who are very uh, important to her, important throughout her life, and uh, know this area well, and know her life and career well, and entertainment well. Great. Let us, thank you very much, we're going to bring out our four panelists. Let's give a big hand to our four panelists who are coming out here today to talk about Maureen Stapleton. Come on out. Yeah. 
Thank you. All right. Let me introduce the four of them, and then we'll get a, a deep dive into all of this. First, Maureen's son with an incredible 40-year career as a documentary filmmaker, award-winning writer, producer, co-founder of Daedalus Productions, which was a 1993 Best Documentary Feature Academy Award nominee for Liberators Fighting on Two Fronts in World War II, Daniel Allen Tuck. Thank you. We have a graduate of Catholic Central, the class of 1973, Executive Director of the Hart Clute Museum, Rensselaer County, and Troy historian, Catherine Sheehan. Hi. <laughs> Curator of the 2013 Maureen Stapleton Life and Career Exhibit at the Hart Clute Museum, creator and manager of her tribute Facebook page, which you all have to follow after this presentation today. It's incredible. It's called And Introducing Maureen Stapleton, William G. Carey, Jr. And the professor of theater at Russell Sage College, Theater Institute at Sage, and a Tennessee Williams scholar, play director, communications teacher, David Baker. Hi, David. Welcome to all of you. So this is going to be great. We're going to talk all about Maureen. We've got some surprises and more. Uh, Dan, let me just start with you and say that was fantastic. That was really, really good. How did you, uh, how was it putting that together? Well, to be honest with you, I had a, the services of a fantastic film editor who, I mean, he ran with it. I supplied him with the material, gave him a general outline of what I wanted. He would go off into his little cave, man cave, and send back bits of it. And yeah. I, I really can't take all the credit for this one. It was... Yeah, but it was tremendous. Thank it was you. just tremendous. We love it. And now, before we get into Maureen's life, we want to give you a, an establishing shot of what Troy, New York was like in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. So, Kathy, for you, yes, Kathy, for you, tell us about what Troy was like when Maureen was growing up. Maureen was born in 1925. What was Troy like in the 20s, 30s, and 40s? Well, it, at that time when Maureen was born, the city was really at its zenith, I think. You know, it was a very big industrial city, um, and just, I think of her walking the streets because within her blocks that she was born, there were five different Catholic churches, all from different ethnic neighborhoods. And um, you had all the, the collar industry and the iron industries. You had the schools, and we had Catholic High. Um, we had, uh, you know, RPI and Russell Sage College. So it was just so many different kinds of people um, walking within this very small Beast, you know, neighborhood that she lived in on First Street, and which uh, there's a plaque there. If you go down First Street, just yeah, before Adams yeah. Street, there's a plaque in her house, and it was just pretty amazing. We had ten mm -hmm. theaters. Um, we we know we, hearing a lot. We'll hear more about that, of course. Is that she loved to go to the theater, so she was going to Proctor's Theater and the Troy Theater and the Lincoln Theater, and all within walking distance of her house, and but really embracing all these different ethnic groups that were here. And every time I've now, so many times since we did the exhibit and now with all this, looking at all of her characters, you could just see that there's some person that she was witnessing from, from, from the neighborhood. Mm. Uh, you know, whether it was an Italian, uh, um, German, Irish, the French Canadians, the large Jewish enclave that was, that was all literally within blocks of her house. And it was, you could just see it was just such an influence on her. That's, that's nice. And, and Dan, I want to go back to you for a moment because during the time, obviously, Maureen was graduated class of 1942. I heard she was in two plays, Murder on a Ferris Wheel and Anne of Green Gables. What do you know about your mother's time at, at Catholic Central? Well, um, you'll be disappointed to hear me say this, but I know actually very little. Uh, really? Certainly about the, her theatrical uh, experience there. She, she was in the two plays you mentioned, but I don't think she could remember, her, you know, her, her own performances in either play. She vaguely remembered being a fat lady who was out of breath, <laughs> or maybe she said, maybe I was just out of breath. Yeah. Um, so about the theater side, I know very little, but I do know, um, you know, she had some amusing stories about her, her time there, which Bill Carey, I believe, 
alluded to uh, at the Monsignor Burns Award uh, dinner. Yeah, Bill, you want to you want to share a story? <laughs> <laughs> one that's appropriate. I heard there wasn't one that was that was yeah. No, there yeah. was, uh, if I recall correctly, the one story had, um, had to do with uh, a French exam that was being given, uh -huh. and uh, there was a. Uh, I think the nun correct, corrected the, the paper, and uh, she accused, the nun asked, said to the one student, um, did, did, you, did you cheat by any chance on this? And she says, um, no, I didn't cheat, sister. I, didn't, I would never do that. And it turns out, she says, uh, she says, well, she goes, your paper says, Jean m'appelle for Francis Rice. Francis Rice. That wasn't Francis Rice. That was the girl <laughs> next to her that she cheated off of. So she wrote down the, that was the. There you go. Are there any descendants of the class of 1942 with us today? Could you raise your hand if you're a descendant of the class of 42? Wow, wow, fantastic. What are the odds? You see, that's great. Maureen said she was the smartest girl in the class. Wow, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. And William, I have to ask you about this Facebook page and yes. how it got started, because what you see on it is all these photos, all these videos, you saw some of them out in the slideshow out in front before you came in, and it's just an incredible collection that you acquired. How did that come to be, and how did your love of Maureen come to be? Well, I think it's, it started with, uh, very simply, with a, uh, um, a simple play, a single playbill. I was on a theater trip to New York City, and. Um, we went into this little theater shop. We had some time to kill in the theater district. And I was flipping through the playbills that they had there, and I saw the rose tattoo. Now, at that point, I mean, it, I was pretty well versed in the plays that she was in because I was a movie-obsessed kid. And it was, you know, there was an actress. I was from Second Street. She was from First Street. It was like, you know, it was like having, you know, a superhero around the corner. You know, it, right. it was kind of, it was, it was fantastic. So uh, I knew her work, and then... Uh, when I saw the playbill, I, it was just this great little time capsule, you know, of, of the moment. And the more, like, you know, over the years, I do more research um, on the internet, and it was hard to find anything that, mm -hmm. um, um, that really represented, like, her contribution to, you know, the, broad, the American theater during, that, during her t time on it, on the stage. And, you know, it's, it's I mean, theater, you know, as you know, it's, it's, it's ephemeral. It's just a second. It's here. And it, I found that like her work wasn't being um, there was nowhere you could go to easily access information about her career, so that kind of that's where it kind of started. I just wanted to um, film and television are easy; they're around, they're going to be around forever. It's just you know right. I just reformat them in a different package and keep rolling them along. But uh, theater is different. There was nothing, and I really think that you know if it's uh, my opinion is that you know the, the, the contribution she made. You know, while she was, you know, during her career, were were huge. Yes. The playwrights that she worked with were like major, major. I mean, and I just thought it wasn't yeah. being. Um, nobody could access information about it, and I just so, thought, well, yeah. You gave them the place to do that. You gave them now the place to see all these photos and all these videos, which is awesome. Yes. Oh, thank you. That's really good. So, David, I'm going to go to you because Maureen had an interesting quote in a book in the early '60s called. The Player, A Profile of an Art by Lillian and Helen Ross. It's a long quote. I've sent you the whole quote, but I'm going to read part of it for the audience here today. This is what Maureen Stapleson said way back in 1961-62. In I believe in the toughness of actors. They're constantly in a state of debasement, making the rounds of casting directors and having to look happy and great. You need a very strong stomach. You need a sense of the business as a whole so you don't get lacerated every time somebody tells you that you're lousy. That's what she thought of acting. What do you make of that quote? Well, first of all, I, I think that you know, Maureen Stapleton should be the uh, last word on acting and not me. But since you asked, um, you know, acting is, uh, well, we think of it as what we see in the media um, and what we think of with celebrity. Um, but, but acting is, is, is almost a step removed from manual labor, you know, it is, it is a re repetitive stress of the spirit. Um, so to be an actor, you, you, have to, you have to hold on to things that we tend to let go of um, as we grow up. You have to hold on to uh, your childhood. You have to gr hold on to the ability to play and to pretend. 
And uh, so I think that what, she, what, you know, what she's saying is it, it's very hard to understand uh, theater or film when you go to see it because what you're seeing is the final product and it's really pretty. And the work on doing it is really hard. Yeah, yeah. And she made it look easy on the screen and on the stage. And the yeah. easier it looks, <laughs> the harder it was. That's it. That is it. She was in the early days of, of the Actors Studio, Dan, and on her journey to Broadway... Tell us a little bit about that and getting the actor's studio going and how she felt on her journey leaving Catholic Central and going to Broadway. Well, I, I, I know about her early years yeah. uh, as a, bef, prior to the actor's studio when she was just, uh, she arrived from Troy. She knew nothing about acting schools other than what she had read in the back pages of theater arts magazines mm. where the many little acting schools in New York would advertise. And one advertisement in particular caught her attention for the Francis Robinson Duff School of Acting. Wow. Apparently, she didn't, knew nothing about the Francis Robinson Duff School of Acting, which taught the Delassart method. Does that sound familiar mm -hmm. to you? The Delassart method, apparently, the body was broken down <laughs> into every single part, right? Eyelid, fingertips. Your body, your face tells the, ex tells the emotion you want to convey. Right. And it's very were, technical. And were te very technical. There were charts galore, and but she was a young, you know, full of energy and enthusiasm. So she tried to memorize those charts. She said, by the time you've memorized half the charts, it was hard to open a door. Wow. <laughs> but after six months, she realized this is for dilettantes. She wanted to find a better school. Mm. She went to. She had heard about classes at the New School of Social Research. Um, and she studied with Herbert Berghoff, who was then teaching there. And from there, she became a charter member of a new organization called the Actors Studio in 1947. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. And now I want to dive into her plays, specifically. And David, I go back to you for that. 1951's The Rose Tattoo was her first collaboration with Tennessee Williams, who you know a lot about. Tell everyone here about the relationship that Maureen had with Tennessee Williams getting this play going and why you feel it's important to, to talk about this with your students. Yeah, I mean, I, I enjoy talking about it with the students because of location, because we live in Troy and somebody named Maureen Stapleton lived in practice, you know, and became an actor from here. Uh, I think she was 26 years old um, when she was in the Rose Tattoo. I believe she did five readings of it with Eli Wallach, um, which is a lot of auditioning, uh, by the way. And it wasn't until uh, Tennessee Williams was really interested in using her in the piece, and, and he messed up her hair and maybe put some dirt on her, and it made her look not so good, <laughs> um, and ended up winning this part. He felt at the time that um, she was better than actresses twice her age. By the way, this character, how old is this character? At least 35, maybe 40. Yeah. Uh, so she was playing out, way outside her age range. Uh, but he said she was better than actresses uh, who were twice her age. And he compared her to Laurette Taylor, who was like the gold standard of Tennessee Williams interpreters. She played Amanda in the Glass Menagerie. Uh, so he was a big fan of her work. And she would go on to become one of the great interpreters of her work, of his work. Yeah. That was her first Tony Award win for the Rose Tattoo. You mentioned Glass Menagerie, Orpheus Descending as well. They kept that relationship going for a couple decades because they clearly liked working with each other. Cat on a Hot Tin Roof uh, yeah. film, um, Glass Menagerie, of course, on Broadway, yeah. 27 Wagons Full of Cotton. Um, I'm sure there's something I'm forgetting. Um, I think altogether she originated three Tennessee Williams uh, original characters, wow. and she, I think it was six Broadway productions of Tennessee Williams' work she was in. So it was... Amazing. It was... And, and Dan, in 1953, Maureen played Elizabeth Proctor. Now, there's a few Catholic Central Current students here today learning about The Crucible from Arthur Miller. And as we were talking in, in prepping for this yeah. today, there, there was a lot that Arthur Miller saw in Maureen and why she needed this part. Yes. Well, she didn't originate the role of, originator, of uh, Elizabeth Proctor, as you right. know. She took over for Elizabeth Strait, um, at which point Arthur Miller closed the production temporarily. 
He fired the director he didn't like at all. I think it was Josh Logan. It could be, I could be wrong. And he restaged the play himself, casting Maureen and E.G. Marshall in the roles that Elizabeth, uh, or rather Beatrice Strait and uh, Arthur Kennedy had originated. And the play was re-reviewed by uh, Brooks Atkinson in The Times, uh, who said the original, I think he said, he may have used the phrase, the shrill something. Uh, the, the political climate, in other words, was so fraught with the McCarthy period that um, this second staging was considered more intimate. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote another scene that hadn't been in the play between uh, Proctor and her husband in jail, which is, oh, which is I think, in the, the, pl the play today. Right. So the second production was really a, you know, a, a radical departure from the, the original. Yeah. And now what we're going to do is transport you all to the 1971 Tony Awards. Let's see what happens at the 71 Tonys. How many for Best Actress in a Play are Diana Rigg in Abelard and Eloise, Maureen Stapleton in The Gingerbread Lady, Estelle Parsons in And Miss Reardon Drinks a Little, Marion Seldes in Father's Day, and the winner is uh, Maureen Stapleton. wasn't that good. <laughs> you think you've been here a long time? Well, I start thanking people. <laughs> I'll try to keep it short. I'll start with my family and my loved ones and the people in Troy, New York and the people in New York City. Now that's an hour and a half. And Neil Simon for a beautiful play and a great part and a great company and a wonderful cast. And the family of the theater, which always exists before us now and after. They are my family. I wanted to spend my old age with my family. I didn't know it would be all in one evening, <laughs> but I've had a wonderful time. <laughs> and I thank you and I love it. And would it be a lot of trouble to do it again? <laughs> as Evie Mira in Neil Simon's The Gingerbread Lady, and that is the Tony that is right here. That's amazing. Stayed in the family all these years. That is great. That is great. We want to show you a little bit of what Maureen was like on the stage. So now this is the 1981 Broadway production of Lillian Hellman's The Little Foxes with Maureen as Bertie Hubbard. Let's take a look at The Little Foxes. Wouldn't that be nice having to sit and listen? Oh, Cal, tell him the left hand draw. You better say it twice, because if 
get things. And, and tell him, be sure not to let any of the things fall or out of the album to bring it right back in here when he gets back. Yes, and, but Simon, he won't get it right, but I'll tell him. Tell him the left hand door, and oh, I was, I was just sending Simon for my music album. Never mind about the album. It's pretty change of mind. Oh, but, but, but Oscar, I well, thought you were Mr. Marshall. Oh, my child. But Oscar, Mr. Marshall said most especially he wanted to see my album. I told him about how Mom and that Wagner. Mrs. Wagner gave him the sign program in the big picture, and he wanted to see that very, very much. <clears throat> we had such a nice talk at supper. You've been chattering to like a magpie. You had a little beat for a second. I can't think it came south any more of you. He wasn't bored. I don't believe he was bored. He, he was an educated, cultured gentleman. I don't believe that. You always you talk like that. What's wrong? Right now. Get yourself in hand. What am I doing? I'm not doing anything. What am I doing? Get yourself in hand. Stop acting like a fool. They're coming now. Well, I don't believe he was born. Oh, Oscar, 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 Oscar,
she just kind of gives this look and just like, she's, you know, she was a minx. You could tell she was like ready to, you know, she was, Ooh. she was like, gotta go, you know, and she like went, you know, so it was, it's a great, it's a great, it was a great piece. Yeah. And it was filmed, by, actually, it was directed by uh, Frank Perry, who directed Mommy Dearest. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's yeah. quite a film too. Yeah. A little yeah. bit of a stretch there, but it was, you know, yeah. but it was, but it was a beautifully shot. I mean, it was like the, angles it just it was, it was yeah. a great sweet little piece there's there's clips yeah. of it online check yeah. it out and that was an emmy win for her there and as we transition to the big screen 1970 airport now airport was the the first modern day disaster movie we've had so many disaster movies 2012 independence day and this is the one that started it all and and spawned several sequels and she got her second oscar nomination for her performance right. in airport right she uh, she lost to Helen Hayes. Um, for Who was also in the actually? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a great Helen Hayes story about this. This is really this is one of my favorites. Um, many, a few years ago, um, Catherine um, Maureen's daughter was nice enough to uh, she uh, we she helped I helped her scan and um, her mother's papers mm. and um, you know I was going through them handling letters from Tennessee Williams and Carson McCuller. I mean all this it was just incredible. The the uh, telegrams from Grace Kelly. It was just amazing. But I came upon this little envelope, um, and it was from Helen Hayes. So mm. I take out the card, and it was a cute little, looked like a little card you'd get at, um, you know, CVS or whatever. Um, and inside it said, I am so happy for your Oscar win. You should have won for Airport, not me. And with mm. the, she goes, now that you have yours, I can actually enjoy mine. Wow. So I was like, classy. Very classy. Classy, about yeah. uh, 12, 13 years later, yeah, yeah, yeah was, with that letter. Yeah. That's really nice. And Airport is quite a movie. Uh, there's trailer, there's video of it online, and it's, a, it's an intense film. It's an intense story with an all-star cast, and she is, plays a pivotal character in that of, of Inez. She's, uh, she plays the bomber's wife. Mm. And I'll be honest with you, the movie, I mean, I don't know if the movie's held up well. It's a little campy. But it's kind of, it's great, it is what it is, you know, it's kind of, but her, but again, as it's, her performance is rooted in, in, in that honesty. And it's yes. just, you know, it's like the, I think if you watch it, the one character you'd probably identify with would be her character of Inez Guerrero. And, you know, it was just, it's, again, it's all on her face. Right. And it's, you know, it's just there. And it's just, uh, you know, it's, you can tell, whatever she accessed or however, how she projected it, it was like, you could just tell that it was coming from a, a place of, such honesty and raw emotion. It was, it was, she's, I don't know, it was, she's gifted. It was a gift, I mean, yes. she is gifted, was gifted. Yes, at this point, nominations for Lonely Hearts for Airport. Airport was a blockbuster, one of the highest grossing movies in 1970. $100 million dollars for Unbelievable, uh, for 19... back then, unbelievable, yeah. Yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. So Dan, at this point, you're, you're 20, 21 years old. What, have you, what do you make of your mother being a stage TV screen and big screen star? Well, that was obviously not the mother that I related to in the, in the home. She wasn't the TV star, stage and screen star. She was mom. She was mom to you, her, yeah. In her torn schmatas and her flip-flops. <laughs> so uh, it was really only when we were out together and uh, people came up to her and said, Miss Stapleton, I saw you in such a, I beg your pardon, yeah. I saw you in such and such a, a, a film or television and your performance meant so much to me. Mm. I started to think, oh, well, she's, I guess she's, she's made her mark because these two people are, you know, coming up to her right and left. Yeah. Her generosity was so extraordinary that if a stranger would say to her, for example, oh, Miss Stapleton, those are lovely earrings you're wearing. She said, oh, you think so? Here, take them. Mm. And the person would, of course, oh, I, no, I didn't mean that. I, I just was a compliment she admiring She would just him. give people she earrings. Said, wow. take the earrings. Wow. Would, no, yes, no. And finally, my mother would say, if you don't take the earrings, I'm going to throw them into the street right now in the gutter. Wow. <laughs> said, okay. I'll, I'll take them. But that was who she was. That's she who was, she was. Yeah. The generosity down to earth. Let me just add to that. Say, we have some amazing pieces that were given um, to our museum when we did the exhibition. And there is a wonderful green dress, and it was a woman by the name of Beverly Kanterwitz. 
and Beverly was driving Maureen. Now, Maureen did not like to drive with many people, as some of you know. And uh, Beverly was taking her to it was the CP Telethon. Mm. And Maureen's like, aren't you coming, Beverly? You're not going to be coming to this event. She goes, oh, I don't have anything to wear. And she goes, oh, come here. We'll go into the closet. And she pulled out this beautiful green dress. And she goes, you have to come, and you have to stay with us. And so she gave her this dress. It fit her beautifully. And she refused to take it back. She goes, no, I want you to keep it. And so she had it all those years. And then um, Beverly donated it to us um, for the exhibition, wow. in which we now have it in the collection. But the other one that's funny, too, I have to tell you, yeah. she donated a beautiful dress to LaSalle Institute, just right over here. And um, it was for a fundraiser. Mm. And so a woman won it. I'm sorry, I don't remember her name. But one of the notes that Maureen wrote on it was, she said, I always thought I was going to be buried in this dress. <laughs> it was this beautiful yellow dress. It was a it was designer dress, yellow with navy blue trim on it. It's very, very pretty. And she said, so, but she goes, now you could be buried in it. <laughs> So we have the note along with the dress and everything. I mean, that was, it was so boring. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. And speaking of clothing and attire, we're going to take a look at a clip now from the movie that earned Maureen her third Oscar nomination, a film called Interiors. And it's what Woody Allen did after Annie Hall. And if you've seen the movie, the vibe of the film is one way. And then Maureen walks in, and the dynamic changes a little bit. Let's take a look at Interiors. Hi, Joey. Hi, Daddy. Renata. Hello, Dad. Hi. This is Pearl. Hello. Hi. I'm Mike. This is Joey. Renata. Glad to meet you. Hi. Hello. Frederick. Here. Hi. Hi. Um, would you like anything to drink? Um, whatever Arthur's having is fine. Here, uh, why don't you sit down there? It's probably the only comfortable place in the house. <laughs> uh, it's good to be back. Well, I'm sure you must have enjoyed Athens. Or you can't beat the Greek islands for sand and blue water. Uh, and the food. I could eat lamb six times a day. <laughs> and this one in a zoo zoo. The only problem I have is oh. nobody spoke English. Oh, it didn't matter. Everybody understood what was important. Did you get a chance to see any of the temples, architecture? Oh, yes. Oh, it's so wonderful. You're steeped in history. We saw some great examples from the 5th century B.C. Remember that little island with the temple? Beautifully preserved. To tell you the truth, I prefer the beaches. <laughs> she could sit in the sun all day. <laughs> oh, that's enough ruins. How many ruins can you see? Over oh, that hot sand, that blue water, that's for me. Well, I don't want to rush anyone, but maybe we should continue this uh, conversation in the other room. First time I went to Europe with my first husband, many years ago, all we saw was churches. One cathedral after another. Don't misunderstand, they were beautiful. So you see two or three, then enough for it. Oh, did you know he was bringing someone? Yeah. Yes, didn't I mention it? You'd be a good Sarah any time. Charcoal. They talk about club steaks and porterhouse. Sarah charcoal and blood rare. Pearl's husband was something of a chef. Mm. <laughs> he was an amateur chef. Actually, he was in the jewelry business. My first husband may rest in peace. Adam, my second, was an orthodontist. How many have you had? Two. Adam had a massive coronary. Rudy was an alcoholic. Would you like some more gravy? Oh, no, no, no. It's too heavy. Oh, <laughs> you would. It's delicious. Try it. Where are you from, Pearl? Florida. Oh, we lived all over the place when I was younger. But I, I prefer a warm climate. I even lived in Australia for a year with my sister Pay when Adam died. I went nuts. It's dead there. I was in uh, Sydney, Australia once. Oh. oh. Was I lying? Or did you like it? Well, it was just a uh, vacation, you know. I was only there a couple of days. Lucky. Oh, it's like a morgue. Nothing to do at night, no pizzazz. I couldn't take that. <laughs> Here's a woman who was dancing every night. <laughs> well, you know what I say. You only live once. Once is enough to play it right. Do you have any children, Pearl? Oh, yes, I have two sons. Lewis and John. Lewis is in real estate. John runs an art gallery. Oh? In the lobby in Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas. <laughs> it's not, not exactly a gallery, it's more a concession. 
Paintings of clowns on black velvet? That's right. Junk. Oh, I tell you, it's pure junk. But people like it. They get a kick out of it. He does very nicely. Pearl collects African art. Oh, oh, I love black ebony. Mm, I own some statues. Actually, they're, they're, they're from Trinidad. Oh, I, I love those real primitive statues with the big hips and the big breasts. Oh, I even have some voodoo masks. <laughs> I believe in that stuff. I could tell you fortune, but I need deck cards. Later, maybe. Mmm. Yes. Oh, that, that, was, that was fun. That was fun. Because yeah, she shook up that movie. Yeah, it it was, was one way, and then it became another. And what are your memories of seeing that for the first time? Well, I think, I mean, Woody Allen, it was a, uh, his homage to Ingmar Bergman and uh, yeah, right. his movie, I think, Cries and Whispers. And it was, I think, the whole, it was, an inten it was all intentional. You know, his, the grays and the drab and, yeah. the, you know, and the characters, let's be honest, the characters are horrible. I mean, the, you know, the, the daughters and, you know, it's a, about a rich family who's, um, um, the mother's mentally ill, the parents separate, right. and the kids are resentful and, you know, upset. And, um, and then Pearl arrives. Yeah. And it's been like the dress. And honestly, she looked like a million bucks. That's yes. the best she ever. I mean, she had a great Paul Huntley wig, um, the hair, the makeup, the nail. I mean, she looked, she looked fantastic. But it was, she was, uh, you know, she was like the brush. She kind of was a breath of fresh air for Arthur, who was E.G. Marshall. Yeah. And the kids hate her for it. Yeah. So it's, it was, but there was the red, just interesting, they have a, the color red is used again at the end of the film. Yes, it when is. When the characters walks into the ocean and, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, drowns, bring her back. And the next scene, you know, they're, uh, Maureen, Pearl, you know, gives her CPR. Yeah. But Pearl is wearing a, a red, like, nightgown. And as she runs across the dunes, flow, you know, so what I, some of the analysis that I've read online said that, you know, Pearl was like a breath of life. She brought Arthur back to life, mm. and then she brought Joey back to life, you know, right. physically, back, you know, back to yeah. life. So it was, yeah. it was a, it's a, it's a great movie. I think it's a great movie. Yeah, it's one of this role has stayed with a lot of people for a long time. David, I want to ask you um, a memory that you have of seeing one of Maureen's films. Does something come to mind? Yeah, it's a Dave Carger memory. Um, you know, for me, it was the electric grandmother as a kid. Uh, it, as good as she was in it, it's really the story that kind of blew my mind, you know. It's not about a grandmother who dies, it's about <laughs> grandkids almost don't make it. Um, but the, other than that, Johnny Dangerously. I mean, before, you know, years ago, if you want to know about theater, you'd look in uh, these big books that had reviews in them. And because I like Tennessee Williams, I'd flip through them and go, oh, there was someone named Maureen Stapleton in um, The Rose Tattoo. I should remember that. I should remember uh, Orpheus Descending. Mm -hmm. um, but then I was connecting it to the work that she did in Johnny Dangerously, which is a filthy film. It's very <laughs> raunchy. Um, but she played it so straight, there was nothing funny about what she did in the film, and she was still one of the funniest people in it. Mm. It was just wonderful. So I, I think, you know, before my knowledge of theater was really cemented, um, yeah, it was Johnny Dangerously and the Electric Grandmother. Whew. Wow. And I think one of the big movies, when you think of Maureen Stapleton, you think of Reds, you think of this, and what's amazing about Reds is that it came out in December of 1981. Also in December of 1981 was an event that took place in this very room, Kathy. This was uh, quite the ceremony that took place here, right? This is when the amazing theater was dedicated to, uh, to Maureen, yeah, and she was here, and oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah, that yeah, was... What a year. <laughs> I believe that was December 15, 1981, when this theater was dedicated as the Maureen Stapleton Theater, and about two weeks prior was the release of Reds with her as Emma Goldman. So quite a month. So this theater was dedicated before she would end up winning this, yeah. before a lot of people got to see this movie, yeah before she went through the crazy award season that all the actors who are going to the Oscars tomorrow have gone through. And what we are gonna show you now is a little bit of her legendary nine minutes in Reds. We're gonna give you a little bit of that. Here she is, ignore the subtitles underneath, but this is one of those powerhouse scenes you have to see of Maureen Stapleton in Reds.
Jack, I think we have to face it. The dream that we had is dying in Russia. If Bolshevism means the peasants taking the land, the workers taking the factories, Russia's one place where there's no Bolshevism. You know, I can argue with cops, I can fight with generals. I can't deal with a bureaucrat. You think Zinoviev is nothing worse than a bureaucrat? The Soviets have no more local autonomy. The central state has all the power. All the power is in the hands of a few men, and they are destroying the revolution. They are destroying any hope of real communism in Russia. They're putting people like me in jail. My understanding of revolution is not a continual extermination of political dissenters, and I want no part of it. Every single newspaper has been shut down or taken over by the party. Anyone even vaguely suspected of being a counter-revolutionary can be taken out and shot without a trial. Where does that end? Is any nightmare justifiable in the name of defense against counter-revolution? The dream may be dying in Russia, but I'm not. It may take some time. I'm getting out. You sound like you're a little confused by the revolution in action, E.G. Up to now, you've only dealt with it in theory. What did you think this thing was going to be? A revolution by consensus, where we all sat down and agreed over a cup of coffee? Nothing works. Four million people died last year, not from fighting a war. They died from starvation and typhus in a militaristic police state that suppresses freedom and human rights where nothing works. They died because of a French, British, and American blockade that cut off all food and medical supplies, and because counter-revolutionaries have sabotaged the factories and the railroads and the telephones, and because the people, the poor, ignorant, superstitious, illiterate people, are trying to run things themselves, just as you always said that they should, but they don't know how to run them yet. Did you really think things were going to work right away? Did you really expect social transformation to be anything other than a murderous process? It's a war, E.G., and we've got to fight it like we fight a war with discipline, with terror, with firing squads, and we just give it up. Those four million people didn't die fighting war. They died from a system that cannot work. It's just the beginning, E.G., it's not happening the way we thought it would. It's not happening the way we wanted it to, but it's happening. If you walk out on it now, what's your whole life, man? Whew, Warren Beatty and Maureen Stapleton in reds. <laughs> William, what's interesting about that performance in that film and all the four films she was either nominated for or won for is that she had about 15 minutes of screen time or a little less such yeah. an impact for short screen time with this film she uh, she I, she bookended it it was like she was at the beginning and she was at the end but what I think was I think what is fascinating about it is that the the relationship that the Warren Beatty character I think it's John John Reed and uh, uh, Emma Goldman have is he almost like a mother-son I mean, they're, they're, you know, they have a cause together, but at the same time, she also gives him counsel about his marriage. So there's like, you see a little bit softer side of, you know, of Emma, mm. because it was interesting when they, uh, I read an article where uh, they said when Maureen, she was doing research, she read Emma Goldman's uh, biography, mm. and she said it, it was horrible, it was dry. The woman, <laughs> the woman was humorless. There was nothing really there to play, just mm. the, you know, she was, you know, she said, she, you know, she was a fanatic, and it was just kind of, she just, I think, focused on the anger, you know, what, the, you know, the, her desire for revolution and everything like that, and anarchy, she, I think she just fed with that. I don't think she's, I, from what I've read, there's a, there's a great article on VanityFair.com called Thunder on the Left, and it's, um, it details the, the making of, of Reds, mm. and it's pretty, it's crazy. It was a crazy shoot. I mean, it was yeah. really. I, I guess mean, she it was, did a scene eighty times. There's that yeah, is on. It was like eight, it was like eighty three yeah. times. And yeah. one, I think the last take, she looked at him and said, "You're out of your mind. Right. You've lost. You're you're insane. You know. It was. That's that. I cleaned it up. Right. Was, you know, but all that, that work like, pays off. All that work pays off. It into, did. It did. I'll that. be honest yeah. with you. She should have won for interiors. Mm. I'm going to play the bitter Oscar card. She okay. Really, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she should have won for interiors. She lost to Maggie Smith. I mean, for California Sweet, perfectly nice role, perfectly sweet, fun. Right. But, you know, at that point, she had won the L.A. Film Critics Award, the New York Film Critics Awards. Mm. She had nominated for a Golden Globe. And, you know, and she was on Mike Douglas shortly after the Oscars for interiors. And she comes out, sits down, kind of like this, you know, yeah. and she, uh, Mike Douglas leans into her and goes, I thought you were going to win. 
And she goes, yeah, so did I. Uh. You know, she, so she was, and then yeah. she went to give, she, he says, did you have a speech prepared? He said, right. she goes, I sure did. He says, well, you want to give it? And it was the speech that she gave when she won her Oscar. Wow. You know, so it there was, you go. So it was like, it was, you know, I think she, she said, she goes, it's just hard on the family. She goes, I'm constantly just, you know. Right. It was interesting, but I like the honesty. Yeah, you know, the award she, season can do that to you. Sometimes you go, I should have won. I should have won. People say that all the time. She did win. Where were you on Oscar night, Dan? In front of the television set. With everyone else. In front of the TV set. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. do you remember what you were feeling in that moment? Timothy Hutton is up there. Yeah. I thought, Mom, you really deserve this. Mm. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. By the way, she despised Emma Goldman. And mm. I think that... Right. Because yeah. of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Her, her really visceral uh, antipathy for this woman, I think, is apparent in her performance. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. such a strong performance, and you're right about how the movie ends, and a little spoiler, but she and Diane Keaton reunite, and Correct. I mean, the way they look into each other's eyes, I, I like to call it like a bring them home moment, Spielberg does it a lot, where it's kind of this just emotional juggernaut punch at the end, and it'll get people crying, and she played that perfectly. And I think that's part of the reason why she won the Academy Award. Oh, I think so, too. Absolutely. It yeah. Was, yeah. And but, then you make a heavy drama like Reds. You want to do something different. So you, you do some comedies. You do some comedies. Johnny Dangerously. She did Cocoon. And we're going to show you now a clip of one of the other comedies that she did in the 80s, starring a guy who hadn't yet scored his first Oscar nomination, let alone won back-to-back -back Best Actor Academy Awards. That was still years to come. Tom Hanks in The Money Pit. Let's take a look at The Money Pit. Thanks very much. Keep the change. This can't be it. It's the address. It's beautiful. I know, something must be wrong. Well, let's go see. Hi! Come on in. Thank you. Excuse the way the place looks. I really let it go to hell since Carlos left. But the house is beautiful. Carlos and I were very happy here. It's all over now. The living room's in here. Huh? Listen, if you want any of the furniture, it's all for sale. Well, I think that we'd like to decorate it ourselves. I'd sell it cheap. I need all the money I can get. Goddamn blood-sucking lawyers are bleeding me dry. <laughs> the floor just needs a little polish. The bedroom's up here. I'm trying to save a few bucks on the lights for the blood-sucking lawyers. I think it's lovely. There's a tricky step. I keep needing to fix it. What a beautiful bed. Could I use your bathroom? Would you use the one downstairs? All my personal things are still in this one. Happiest moments of my life since we left Paraguay. I've been spent right here in this room. You lived in Paraguay? Ten wonderful years. Carlos is from Asuncion. I'm awfully sorry. About what? I don't know, actually. Do you want to buy the bed? I... I think so. You know... You think you know somebody. After 25 years, and then one day, Israeli intelligence comes to the door. Israeli intelligence? Last Tuesday. That's why I've got to sell the house. It turns out... Carlos was Hitler's pool man. 
Wow, funny, yeah. Tom Hanks, Shelley Long from Cheers, and I will always think of her as Carol Brady in the Brady Bunch movie. That's a, you were reciting lines as that was going on, Kathy. Oh, no. Yeah. It's, it's definitely, it, it's, that was one of my favorites. And it, it just, it's the beginning of the end. She does the same thing. Yeah. Book ends, she books book ends, book ends yeah. the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what range? I mean, she can pull off a, a comedic scene off. like that with ease, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. yeah. You, you don't forget lines like that. Ever. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great memory. Um, in the year 2000, Maureen Stapleton returned here to Hudson Valley Community College. Kathy, you want to tell us a little bit about her yeah. return? She was here, and you know what's interesting? Um, there's a wonderful website now called fultonhistory.com, and I was, I, was sending, I was sending William uh, some of these things. Do you know what she did one day? She came after she was, you know, she was here for appearances and things. She got on a bus and went down to Troy and went and walked around, walked around the old neighborhood and just, you know, talk. And she was doing some interview with somebody about it, you know. She said, oh, yeah, it was great. It was so nice to see, see the old neighborhood and walk around Washington Park and, and uh, back over. And, and you, you, she just had this just flood of memories. And, and even at that point, she wasn't living far away, just over, over in Lenox. But, uh, yeah, yeah it, it's really, it, it's amazing. I was just over there last week doing a, doing a Gilded Age lecture, and That's so right. many people came up and said, oh, you're trying, oh, Maureen Stapleton, we know Maureen. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I was talking with Benita Zahn the other day, longtime uh, News Channel 13 anchor, and she said that from the people she talked to, Maureen mentally never left Troy. She never went Hollywood, per se. She was always in love with this community wherever she went. And that's powerful. That is powerful for sure. And, and William, you got to meet her a little later in life, right? I did. I did. Um, I was lucky enough. Um, um, I'd created a website. Well, I designed this website. This was, this was years ago, before the Facebook um, mm. page. And uh, a friend of hers had um, come across the page, contacted me, and um, asked if... Um, I'd like to. I'd probably like to meet her, and I said, "Sure, I'm like, oh, absolutely." So I, uh, I went over, and you know, she was. Uh, her health was in decline, and um, I remember I walked in. Um, we walked in, and her friend uh, excused himself. He had to use the men's room, and I'm s sitting there. I'm standing, you know, sitting there with Maureen Stapleton, and I'm like, truly just mouth is open. I didn't know. And the first thing she said to me was, "You're from Troy," and I said, "Yep," I, I said. I said, well, I'm from Second Street. And she goes, oh, high class. And I said, <laughs> and I said, I go, no, 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 no. I said, down by the Manans Bridge. I said, we're, you know, I'm not, not the park, not, not the, the park. park. But uh, yeah, that was, that was the first thing. She, you know, she was like, you're from Troy. That was the, um, I think that kind of, that was a, it was, yeah. it was important to her, I believe. I yeah. truly do. Yeah. Yeah. David, what do you think of, of all the memorabilia? You, you all got to see it out front a little bit. You'll get to see some more um, after this today. Th there are playbills out there. There are many pieces of iconic memorabilia and all the posters and, and the wonderful things out there. What does it say to you about her legacy and, and the impact of what she brought to the stage and the screen? Mm -hmm. Her, her legacy is huge. And um, you know, I think the most interesting thing to me about Maureen Stapleton was, you know, Beyond our ideas of celebrity or superstardom, uh, she was an actor's actor. And to be an actor's actor means that actors are your fans. And to have the respect of your peers and to um, originate roles uh, with great playwrights and to have worked so consistently uh, in so many different mediums, I just think speaks highly you know, of what she's going to, what she brings to um, the history of acting and um, the history of theater. So when I look out there, I see, wow, to have had that career? Are you kidding me? Um, it means very much to me, you know, Russell Sage College has, holds no, you know, special claim to Maureen Stapleton. But when I read her autobiography and how she liked to watch films, I think about, Oh, she had, to, she had to pass through this campus when she would go see films. Yeah. And so uh, in my mind's eye, that's where she is. Yeah, nice. Dan, what, what do you think she would think of a day like this? Oh, she'd be over the moon, Jackson. She'd yeah. be absolutely over the moon. Troy was indeed her home always, even though she was a New Yorker for at least a half a century. Right. Um, it, it, it meant a great deal to her. Yeah. 
Oh, well, we're not done yet. We're going to do <laughs> audience Q&A. Okay. We are going to pick out a few people from the crowd. We have a microphone, I believe, and we're going to have uh, Colin, who is also here from Catholic Central School. Um, if you'd like to raise your hand, maybe we can do, we can start with one from uh, this section and then the middle and then, and then uh, on the other side. Uh, so if anybody in this section has a question for any of our panelists and you want to raise your hand, then Colin will come over with the microphone. All right, we're going to go to this uh, young woman up here. <laughs> I think so. The lights, yes. But yes, come on up. <laughs> If you were just beginning to look into Maureen Stapleton, what film would you recommend or what piece would you think would be the best to start with? Um, question to William. Oh, um, oh, you said film. Well, I would direct you to the theater. I would say, I'd give you a couple of things. I would say, um, listen to the 1966 cash recording of the Rose Tattoo. That way you'd get a flavor of her on stage um, for, uh, Tele for television, I would say Queen of the Stardust Ballroom, just because it's it's just a it's just a it's a fantastic it's fun it's a fun movie and she's fantastic in it. I think for f film, I mean it's kind of there's a lot to pick from. I mean um, Interiors is great. Um, I think the first act of Plaza Suite is pretty fantastic. She's pretty terrific in that. Um, Lonely Hearts. Unhinged. She was one. She was great. She was. It was pretty. That's where the name of the website came from. The, ah. the uh, well, Facebook page. Yeah. The poster for Lonely Hearts uh, had big and introducing Maureen Stapleton. That's where the so name I, came from. So and introducing I looked Maureen at that Stapleton. That's from, great. From there for that. But yeah, I would say you know Lonely Hearts. Any um, yeah, interiors. Absolutely. All right, we're going to go to the. Thank you for that question. We're going to go to the middle section now, and uh, somebody down in front. So I have a couple of stories about Maureen, my meeting her. Um, my late partner and I were in, uh, at the Candlelight Inn in Lenox. Uh, we went after a Tanglewood concert, and we were in the bar, and who was sitting at the bar doing charades was Maureen. As you know, she loved to do charades. Uh, so we got to know her then. I said, you know, I'm from Troy, New York, and then we were instantly best friends. <laughs> uh, and it, as it turned out, we were, um, we, were able, we were on the committee when they rededicated in 2000, and so we were able to go to her, her apartment, and she loaned us some of her films, uh, pictures, and memorabilia. But we, went, we took her to dinner at the Candlelight Inn, which she loved to be at, um, and the waiter came to our table, and before anything, she said to him, you got one? <laughs> meaning charades. She loved, as I said, she loved charades. But she was a marvelous, just very down-to-earth woman. And I, I just, you know, you just were her instant friend. Um, she was very warm and very lovely. And um, I had the pleasure of playing Maureen, of portraying Maureen at the famous Ladies Tea, which is a fundraiser for the, um, the uh, literacy volunteers. That's and great. I learned so much about her. She was just a marvel. Thank you. Thank you for that memory. We appreciate all of that. That's great. I think we're going to have time for one question over in this section. Uh, if anybody in this section has a question, or if we go to one other question, we'll go to the gentleman right here. Did she raise her family or anyone in Troy? Did she raise the, your, the family? No, ever in we, Troy. We, we grew up in New York City. Hmm. I was born in 1950, my sister Catherine four years later. Um, but we, we would go up to Troy frequently to see our visit our grandmother, who lived on Terrace Place. Oh. And, and you all thought of this area as fondly as she did. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially my grandmother's house. She was yeah. a hoarder. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to go there. <laughs> all right. Well. Thank you for those questions. Thank you for those memories. We have one more little video surprise for you all. I've had the pleasure of being on The Tonight Show twice. It was with Jay Leno. Maureen 
was with the king. She was with Johnny Carson the night after the Academy Awards. Here is a moment of that great night. I'm sure you all know this lady if you uh, have watched the movies or gone to the theater or watched television any time in your life. She is really a fine actor. She's received 50 nominations during her career, four for Oscars, four for Emmys, six Tonys, and one Grammy. The last night she won her first Oscar as Best Supporting Actress. She'll be starring in The Glass Menagerie in Denton, Texas, April 16th and 17th. Would you welcome Maureen Stapleton? I suppose you're getting sick and tired of people coming up to you today or calling you and saying, congratulations, congratulations, Kurt. Are you not getting tired of that? No, I'm not getting tired of that. Well, would you like to try it? I, I wouldn't. I would. <laughs> oh, I yeah. would like being cold. I was really happy for you. Oh, I was that too. Was nice. I, I was. Yeah, first of all, I've got a telegram here. I've got to read. <laughs> On behalf of all the proud citizens of Troy, New York. Oh, my Lord. Oh. I would like to send our sincere congratulations to Troy's number one goodwill ambassador, Maureen Stapleton, for her Oscar-winning performance in Reds. Francis J. Flynn, uh, the mayor of the city of Detroit and the city Troy, council Troy. of Troy City Hall. Uh, right, there you are, from the mayor. <laughs> hey, that's my, that's my yeah. hometown. That's your hometown? Yeah. Oh, isn't that nice of the mayor to it's do that? very nice. Yeah. Why wouldn't you call it Helen? That would have been nice, wouldn't it? Helen of no Troy. There wise guys around. <laughs> <laughs> That would have been a dirty trick. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. There you are with Johnny. Oh. He hosted that Oscars that year, and that's a treat, and that's a clip that will live on forever, as are all the clips we showed today, all the memories that we shared of Maureen Stapleton. I want to thank our panelists very much. Give them a big hand. David, William, Kathy, Dan. I also want to thank Catholic Central School. Congratulations on 100 years. Wow, centennial year. For this to be a part of that is awesome. Hudson Valley Community College, everybody here, the tech people, everybody, the entire staff, everybody here has been wonderful. And the woman who put this whole thing together is Denise Ministry, and I don't know where Denise is right now. She's in the back. You put this whole thing together, as well as the reception that is taking place uh, outside when everybody leaves here today. Thank you for having me on board, for bringing all of us together, and to celebrate and share in Maureen's legacy. Thank you, Denise. Enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the Oscars tomorrow. I think Oppenheimer is probably going to win Best Picture, and we'll talk about more categories afterwards. Jackson, we just want to thank you for oh, an amazing you. job today. Thank you. And I had a thrill doing this. Thank forward. you. It was so great to meet him. Thank you. And thank you to, to Catherine and to Max. They brought, uh, along with you, Dan, the awards here today and for being here. Um, we hope we did her proud. So thank you for being here and supporting this. The reception outside, have a good day. The Oscars tomorrow is at seven o'clock. It's earlier than ever. Enjoy the show, enjoy the rest of your weekend, and thank you for celebrating Maureen Stapleton here in her theater today. Thank you all so much. <laughs>